Okay, I think it's recording. Yay, okay, it looks like it's working. Okay, so we are starting first, Peter, and y'all jump in at any time when you have questions or thoughts or you wanna go into something um, and we'll go there. But the goal of going through first and second, Peter, um, come when you can and when you can't, that's no problem. You can watch them later on YouTube and catch up. Um, but there's my dog. I, clearly the Amazon man is here <laughs> because Murphy feels like it's his one duty in all of life to bark at the Amazon man. So, um, but what we kind of want to do with this is uh, my goal is to model how to um, study this way and go in depth. When you're looking at scripture, um, there are so many different levels you can look at, but the things that I would always start with when you're looking at scripture is to remember um, a few things that make it easier. One is that all scripture is patterns. And when you start looking for patterns and realizing that patterns exist in scripture, then you start being able to catch more of the deeper levels of scripture. So patterns, for instance, are things like realizing in scripture, all time is Trinitarian. And if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say Trinitarian, I'm talking about the concept when Jesus in the book of Revelation says, he is what was, what is, what is to come. Well, in the book of John, we find out that Jesus is the word, right? So when we are taking the living word, and that is Jesus, in the beginning, God spoke everything into existence, and it's like that's Jesus coming, um, bringing everything into flourishing of existence. So you want to remember that all scripture was, these people are real people, really happened, and the prophecy, I mean, and the stories really happened. Jonah, real guy really got swallowed by a whale. But then you wanna realize that scripture is. So scripture right now is speaking to us and is um, alive and moving, and God wants us to read the logos word, meaning the written word, and, find, and have it become rhema word, meaning the God spoken word to you. When the Holy Spirit moves in you and you're like, whoa, I needed that, that's for me right now. And then the third thing you want to remember about scripture is that it is to come. So this is the one that I would say most of us maybe, possibly, may not be the case for you, but growing up in the church, I was not taught this one as an overarching concept. I was taught that it applied to moments in scripture, but not Genesis to Revelation. I was taught that there are prophecies in scripture, but I was not taught this Trinitarian concept that every single story in scripture is actually prophecy. So let me give you an example. Um, we can talk about um, the Echeda, right? Like the moment when Abraham brought Isaac up on the hill. And you can see that that was prophetic for what Jesus Christ, the father was going to bring Jesus to the cross, right? So you can see it in pieces. But what if you realize, hey, buddy, <laughs> what if you realize that from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, all of it are pro is, um, a, is prophecy. And this is in the book of Revelation. I'm not just like randomly stating this, but Revelation 19 says... Um, this is Revelation 19, 10. I fell down at my feet to worship him. This is the angel he's talking to. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay. So what he's saying is the whole thing was about Jesus from beginning to end. It was all prophetic word. And so um, Old Testament and New Testament come together when you realize these patterns together. So you want to look for patterns in names. You want to look for patterns in character of God. You want to look for patterns in geographic location. That's super important. So um, you want to notice how many times is this happening in the same place? Why is God mentioning these things? Um, did anyone ever do a precepts Bible study? Okay, Arthur. Okay, remember all the little crayons you had to stick between your fingers and you're like trying to highlight everything? It stressed me out. <laughs> it really did. But what she was trying to get you to do was notice patterns. 
it really, it really was the concept of noticing patterns and starting to realize that patterns is, are telling the story. Um, numbers are really significant in scripture, and you can um, often overlook that. I want to give a little just um, thing of a word here, not numbers as in fortune cup like cookie numbers, right? We're not like looking for numbers like they're a magic eight ball and, oh, there's my favorite number and it means good things for me. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about understanding that numbers are used by God to um, create a pattern to tell you a story. Um, I have this long list in the back of my Bible. I'll just kind of show it to you. Um, I have a lot of lists, so let me find the right list. See this one? This kind of gives you an example. I write down numbers and then the pattern of what they mean in scripture so that when I see the number four, for instance, I immediately know, well, four always stands for creation of earth. It's an earth thing, a temporal thing. When you see the number three, that's Trinity, right? It's always like, remember how many people came to see um, Abraham at the tent door? Abe there were three that came. It's the, it's the positioning of God coming to Abraham. Um, eight, for instance, is always new beginning. How many people went across on the ark? Eight, right? There's eight in that ark. Um, seven is completion. So you have a lot of those patterns that once you learn them, certain things that happen in the New Testament, you realize, oh, wait a minute, it's telling us a deeper thing here. So um, any questions about those kind of concepts? Make sense? <laughs> so as we get into this, um, you'll see more and more what I'm talking about, but I wanted to kind of give you that basis there. So let's, uh, let's start with prayer and we'll hit first Peter. Does that sound good? Yep. Anyone want to pray or do you want me to pray? What do you want to do? Go for it. <laughs> Lord, we just thank you so much, God, that you are a father who is constantly revealing to us and always wanting us to learn, to grow closer, to go deeper into the spirit. Father, I ask for the spirit of revelation and wisdom as we walk in this with you. In your holy name, amen. Okay, so we're going to hit First Peter. I made a board because I like boards. I'll take a picture of this to get closer for you and post it underneath if you like want to get closer, but I'll run you through what's up here too. Um, when you look at First Peter, um, does anyone know anything that you want to like throw out about First Peter? Like where it's written or who wrote it? <laughs> well, Nope. <laughs> I love it. Nope. Good. Good. <laughs> this is why I'm on 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 here. <laughs> good. I don't know, like I knew this great thing I want to talk about there. Um, Did you write it. Yeah. Well, Peter. Let's say Peter wrote it by voice, but it's Sylvanus that actually pens it for him. Okay. Um, remember the book of Mark in the Gospels is writ is Peter's account written by John Mark. Peter never wrote anything. He's a fisherman. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he can't write now. I, I'm pretty sure he can. I don't know Peter. <laughs> but he actually never pins it. Like Paul is pinning his own stuff often, whereas Peter is not. Um, Sylvanus writes this. It's written from Rome. When you get into 2 Peter, you realize he is in the maritime prison. And when you go to Rome, you can go to that prison. This is also where Paul would be held. I wish the dinging thingy would stop on my computer. Um, stop it. <laughs> so um, you see that P Sylvanus is pinning this. They're in Rome. And he's writing it. If you just jump to the back, you'll see from Babylon or to those in Babylon. I'm sorry. And that is a, um, he's talking about Rome. He's calling Babylon Rome. But it's really important for us because this kind of puts it into, um, like for us to like see what he's really talking about. So Peter um, has, Peter will die in Rome as well. And he will die by tradition upside down on a cross. Remember Jesus told Peter he would die, right? Peter knew from Jesus, hey, you're going to die and you're going to lead, be led somewhere you don't want to go. So by tradition, by the early church fathers, Peter dies where the Vatican is right now. And he dies upside down because he would not be crucified upright as Jesus was. He said he wasn't worthy. So he's crucified upside down. 
and um, supposedly in the place which was um, the circus at the time, but now is the Vatican. Um, a couple things about Peter. He is from Capernaum. Um, and Capernaum becomes Jesus's main like area that he goes back to over and over because Peter lives there. Peter is married. Peter has a wife. Remember, Jesus will heal his mother-in-law. Um, and Peter is a fisherman who becomes a disciple, who becomes an apostle. All right. So um, there are 12 di um, disciples and 11 of them become apostles because Jesus is on, and Paul replaces the 12th apostle. Some, it, you could kind of see it, um, Matthias is the one they vote in, but he's never heard of again, right? And so you really have a question. There's a lot of the theologians who have questions on whether or not they were supposed to vote Matthias in. They were not told to do that. They cast lots to do that, like it's Old Testament. And Jesus told them to wait and receive the Holy Spirit, not to start casting lots and figure stuff out. He told them to wait. So Paul comes in and calls himself the apostle. So um, Paul kind of um, is the 12th apostle. Um, so remember, Peter denied Christ three times. He is reinstated by Jesus three times when Jesus asked, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Remember, that is one time per denial that he is reinstating Peter in his position of Christ. Um, and then Peter very famously is the one who acts 10. He will get the vision of the sheet being laid out with all the unclean animals. And he's told, eat. And he tells God three times, I don't eat unclean things. Remember, do you see the patterns that Peter has? Three times denial, three times reinstated, and then he says three times kind of no again to God. So Acts will follow Peter from Acts 1 to Acts 10 or 12, right in there. You could say um, really 12, I guess, is the transition. After Acts 12, Peter is replaced, if you will, with Paul. After he denies the, the sheet of the eating, Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentile. Peter really is not the apostle to the Gentile that maybe, who knows, he should have been. He becomes more of the Jews, and he does work with the Gentiles as well, but Paul is the one that is like, hey, I'm the apostle to the Gentile. So at that point, the book of Acts switches from the main character, if you will, being Peter, to Paul, and Paul will finish the book of Acts out. Um, he is in the inner circle of Christ. This is really important for us to kind of start mapping what God was doing, with what Jesus was doing. He had 70, and then he had 12 within that 70 that was an inner circle of the 70. But then within the 12, there are three more that is an inner, inner circle. And we say it's a three, Baker's dozen, if you will, because it is going to be Peter, Matthew, no, Peter, James, and John, sorry. <laughs> Peter, James, and John are in that inner circle, but it's a Baker's dozen, if you will, because it's sometimes Andrew, right? Sometimes Andrew is included into that inner circle. They see things that the other disciples do not see, and now you get what Peter is writing because second Peter is totally based on and is the telling of what he learned at the transfiguration. That inner circle is all that was at the transfiguration, right? Um, Jarius's daughter, the raising of Jarius' daughter, only the inner circle went there. The famous Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, that's the inner circle again. So often Jesus pulled in his teaching to a much smaller group within a group to teach an inner circle. And I honestly believe it's like um, his, his form of how he discipled. And I do believe that we should also model that, that it's great to have the big group and then a smaller group and an even smaller group of where you do um, work out deeper things of life. So Peter is a part of that inner circle. Um, and Peter, um, is the brother to Andrew. Remember they're brothers. And, um, okay. So let's look at this. A big thing about Peter's name that we talk about a lot. Peter's name is of originally Simon. 
right? And he is called Simon, even though Jesus says, hey, I'm going to rename you. He is called Simon until Matthew 16. Simon means a reed, like that would blow in the wind, you know, um, reeds that grow by the water. And so Simon is called, if you get this picture of someone that's just blown in the wind, and James writes that we're not supposed to be people that are just blown in the wind. But the beautiful picture of Peter is that God calls him Cephas. We say Petros, right, which is Peter in English. I know it's like all these different names because you're talking about all these different languages. The real name is Cephas, C-E-P-H-A-S. And that means the rock. Now, in history, you've got different versions of this, but um, in Catholicism, they believe Peter is the first pope, okay, in Rome. Interesting enough, and, and go do your, your research if you would like, there's no evidence that he was ever a bishop even in Rome. Okay, and the popeness, right, that we, we talk about, that doesn't even start to 400 AD. So Peter is not the first pope, and I'm not knocking, I've got great Catholic friends, but I'm just talking about to go back to Matthew 16 and really understand what it mean, meant to say, upon this rock, I will build my kingdom. So let's just jump for one second to Matthew 16, because this Matthew 16 is going to be a pivotal moment of why he writes 1 Peter, and you're going to see it very strongly in 1 Peter chapter 2. But here in Matthew 16, verse 18, no, let's start in 17. This is where at Caesarea, Jesus answered him, blessed are you, because he just asked Peter, who do they say I am, right? And, the, and this is Peter's shining moment, okay? And when, old, when Simon becomes Cephas, because the one that was blowing around like the wind and didn't know who he was and didn't know would bend to anything becomes the rock because he gets a word from God and says, when he says, who do you think I am? Or who do you say I am? He says, you are the Christ, the living God. Peter comes out, the solid man comes out because he's speaking the truth that Jesus says, this was given to you from heaven, right? To understand this. And Jesus answered him, and this is in Matthew 16, verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah. It's so important that you underline that name right there because all Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, okay? Like this. But the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We have to constantly be connecting these in order to understand what Jesus was saying. If we did not have the Old Testament, we would not understand 99% of the New Testament. So what he's saying here when he calls him Simon Bar Jonah, Bar means son of Jonah. Now in the physical, he could be literally saying, hey, your daddy's name is, is jo Jonah. But the spiritual implication here is that they will both be in Joppa, okay? Jonah, Old Testament prophet, is in Joppa when he receives the call from God that says, go to the Gentiles. And Jonah's like, I'm not going there. They're dirty. I don't like them, right? Go to Nineveh. You are crazy. And he runs the other way. Well, Peter in Acts 10 will be in Joppa. When he receives the same call of the, um, that we just spoke about, when the sheet is going to be lowered from the heavens and all these unclean animals, and he's going to say, eat it, he's talking about it's time to bring the Gentiles in. And Peter goes, mm -mm, no, no, no. Like he's stressed about it because he cannot see that far off. He's been taught a certain way. So he's calling him son of Jonah. And it's prophetic because you're going to see the connection all the way with Peter that he's going to struggle. Remember, Paul will even um, admonish Peter saying, hey, you hang out with the Gentiles when no one's looking, but when the Jews are around, you won't even hang out with them. Remember, Paul will get on Peter for this. And you can see that Jesus has got this like prophetic thing calling him, hey, Simon, the reed that is the son of Jonah right? You can see that he's connecting these things. So he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Cephas. Okay, this is where Peter's name gets really comes into play. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So traditionally, the church held that he was talking about Peter being the rock. But when you look at this in the Greek, it's a play on words. He's saying upon, it, I almost wish like if we were standing there with Jesus, do you know like if you text something, you would miss my face, right? With I'm like, I don't like you, right? And you're like, you don't like me. But if I was like this, I don't like you, right? It's a totally different context. And so if you could see Jesus, I believe that you would see his hand, his hand saying, you will be called Cephas and upon this rock. Because from Genesis to Revelation, you have to follow the pattern. And Paul tells us that the rock was Jesus Christ, right? So it's not like he's saying, now Peter, you're gonna become me. He's saying, okay, Peter, you're going to be a part of me by being Cephas, the one that's not moved. And it's a prophecy for the church. The church was never the rock, Jesus was the rock and the church is built upon him. And that is the prophecy. So for so long, we were taught things like, okay, that meant Peter was the Pope or Peter was the head of the church and God built it on Peter. But if you jump over to Matthew 18, he actually repeats um, everything he said to Peter. He repeats again in Matthew 18 to all of the 70 and says, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. It wasn't that Peter was so important. It's that he is a pattern or a prototype for the church. All right. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, I just, I'm just throwing information out at you. So if you're like, wait a minute, go back. Or if you want me to just, just pop on and say what you want me to tell you. <laughs> so, um, so that's key to understanding Peter. And Peter, as he writes 1 Peter. All right, so I'm going to jump back over to 1 Peter. Now, the next question that we want to ask, man, I wish I could quit my dinger dinger thing, but I don't know how to stop it. Mark has read. Maybe that will work. I don't know. Um, oh, you know what? I think I can say don't like. There is a way, right, to say like don't ding. Oh, well, I'll figure it out sometimes. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about next who the book is written to. So we know it's written by Peter. We know that it's written from Rome to ba those in Babylon. And Babylon is always, always a prophetic picture of the kingdoms that are against God and not for God. And um, so who is it written to? If you start asking this question and looking this up, you will find a lot, you will have, find two different camps. You will find one camp that says, this is written to the Jews that have become Christians that were scattered. And then you're gonna find one camp that says, no, no, this is written to the Christians who were scattered, okay? So um, these are the two camps you're gonna find. If you looked at the earliest, like Eusebius, Jerome, our early church fathers, you're gonna find a 50-50 split in them as well. Now remember, they're still about 200 to 500 years after um, Peter, so they're still giving their opinion, but they're split, and I'll tell you why. At the very beginning of this, it starts out by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he says, it's his apostleship is non-question. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Do any of y'all have a different version that has it written a little bit differently? I have strangers in the world. Okay, okay. I have I have the New King James. So this says the pilgrims of dispersion. Okay, okay. So strangers, pilgrims, um, all of those words are um, the same in the Greek. Um, elect, and I wrote it here. It's parapedimos in the Greek. Okay, and that's P A R E P I D E M O S. And the Greek, it's parapodemos. Um, there, it is different, actually, than strangers, or, or I mean sojourners, sorry, that you'll see him use um, in just a little bit in 1 Peter 2, 11. But the word dispersion is there in the Greek. What is that? What does that mean? 
that is, and, and the word is the diaspora, okay? And that's spelled D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A. -A. The diaspora begins in Old Testament. The diaspora is when they fall to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon takes over and they do not have their land, it is called that the Jews are in the diaspora, the scattering and spreading out. I want you to remember that God prophesied this all the way back in Deuteronomy, over and over, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 30. He told the Jews, I've got this covenant for you. If you do not obey, you will be scattered among the nations. Okay, every time you see that in Old Testament, I want you to, um, <laughs> I'm getting all these texts. How do I get in that Zoom link? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really good at it. <laughs> um, here, I'll just post it here. Um, I'm not good at this, just not good technologically. Um, okay, so you wanna remember with the diaspora, that my thingy won't work oh well um every time you see that that was a season and a time promised to israel it does not end until 1948. okay do you realize how close we are to that it's crazy when you stop and realize that's our grandparents generation the diaspora lasted from nebuchadnezzar taking down um of israel until 1948. But see, the church missed this because you had all these theologians come in, Origen specifically, and then Augustine. And they saw that Israel didn't have any land, right? At 70 AD, they lose their land again, right, with Rome. And they're like, hey, that's over. It must have been an, an allegory. It was not literal. Because no one could see that Israel was gonna get their land back. We thought, it's been too long. Clearly, you're not getting your land back. Um, even when they were in Rome, they were occupied. Remember, Rome occupied Israel, even in Jesus' time. And so though they had the temple destroyed in 70 AD, they didn't have their land. So Origen and Augustine start teaching what we say is allegorical um, scripture. And they start saying, that was all about the church, not Israel. Do you see what, what happened? They couldn't see what was gonna happen. So the diaspora is specifically about the Jews being scattered and not having their land. Why is that important? You and I don't get Florida when we become a believer, right? It's not like you have Christ and I'm giving you Florida. But if you're Jewish, when you came into covenant with God, you got God and land. It's a different, remember that's old covenant versus new covenant. And so these are different, but what does scripture say about old covenant? It says that it is never ceasing, right? It doesn't mean like we teach like old covenant's over, now new covenant's here. But the promise to the Jews, it says is everlasting. It says it's over when the sun no longer is in its position, when the sea no longer is held back, that's when that's over. So apparently to me, it's still going um, in the sense that that land is still promised and those covenants are still in place. Now you can get into a long, long thing of that, but to go back to 1 Peter, this is written to the elect exiles who are in the diaspora. I believe why he wrote it this way is really important, actually, that I believe that Augustine is right and Jerome and Origen, because I believe it is written to the Jews in the diaspora that are spread out. Um, if you jump to 2 Peter, I'll just show you an example. 2 Peter's greeting is going to be different to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing. Well, who would that be? That's you and me. We, through the new covenant, obtained the faith of equal standing to the promise of Israel. So you can see there's a difference, but I believe the Holy Spirit had Peter do this on purpose because if you get into 1 Peter 2, he's gonna use verbiage for Gentiles. But if you did not know the history of the Jews, you would not understand half of this book. So what I'm gonna tell you is, I think they were both right, because I think it's done by the Spirit and it represents Romans 11. If you don't know what I'm talking about, do y'all know what I'm talking about when I say Romans 11 or you wanna jump over there real fast? Oh yeah. 
jump out. Yeah, let's, let's jump really fast. Okay, cool. Really fresh. Yes. Let's jump to Romans 11. Okay, sometimes I feel like my Bible goes missing, but there's Romans 11. There we go. Okay. So to understand the book of Romans, I'm going to do this in two sentences, I promise. <laughs> Remember, 1 through 8 is all Christian doctrine. If you want to know what we believe, Paul wrote it in Romans 1 through 8, foundation. But then 9, 10, and 11 all answer one question, what about the Jews? Remember, Paul is answering to the Romans what to do that now you don't have to get circumcised, okay? He's talking about circumcision of heart. And so now he's got to answer, well, what about the Jewish guy that's standing there going, wait a minute, what about all of our history? What about everything else? Is it all gone now? So 9, 10, and 11 answers, what about the Jews? And then 12 to 14, 15, those are going to be practical application. That's the full breakdown of the book of Romans. And it makes it easier if you memorize it that way to, if people are like, where's that in Romans? You're like, well, if it's about Israel, it's 9, 10, or 11, right? It just kind of helps you categorize it. But 11 specifically lays out um, what happens to the Jews now that Christianity is here. And what he's going to say is, God has God rejected his people? This is 11 verse 1, by no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people who he foreknew. See that word foreknew? We're going to use it in two seconds. It's going to say in the beginning of 1 Peter, according to the foreknowledge of God. Okay, so I want you to connect these words that are being used. The elect were foreknew. Israel was foreknew before you and I were known. So it's gonna, he's going to jump down, and he's going to say um, the elect were hard-hearted, and so they were rejected for a time, okay? If we don't understand this in Christianity, so much of the Bible becomes unclear, because what he's going to say is, jump down to verse 11, um, did they stumble? so that they might fall by no means. Rather, their trespass salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. This is what he's saying in a nutshell. And he's going to go on and on saying we should not be arrogant as the church because if you think Israel's done, then what about us? Because we are grafted into that tree. So if we believe God cut them off at the root, what happens to our grafting? then we're done as well. And y'all, look at the church of today. We're doing the exact same things that Israel did in Old Testament. So if we think God's done with the Jews, then why would we think he'll honor our covenant? Mm -hmm. And so that is what Paul is laying out here. And what he says is this in verse 25. To be wise in your own, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. Remember, Paul will write of seven mysteries in the New Testament. So circle this one and put one of the mysteries of Paul, because you should know all seven. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until. Circle the word until. The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And he's going to go on and say, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So we use this verse a lot. We say, well, don't worry, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That's true, and I use it for myself too, right? But what he's actually talking about is Israel's salvation. And, I, and often we don't connect that, right? We don't connect the full T of what that's talking about. So when you get to 1 Peter, the reason this is important is that what he's saying is, I'm writing this to the Jews that are scattered, but that now means you too, because you're grafted in and you are scattered among Babylon, just like the Jews were scattered in Babylon in the Old Testament. So it gives you this picture of what Peter is really trying to tell you. So the summary of First Peter is right here in the, in the opening. And it's telling you that this journey, this exile, the diaspora that we as believers are going to be even in this church age, um, that we can live in the midst of it, knowing our eternal promise is coming, but taking the inheritance now and tomorrow and to come, even when we're scattered in the middle of Babylon in the world and that Elohim, God, Yahweh is with us still. 
And that's really the, the message. If you want, Peter becomes a Jeremiah. Peter becomes an Isaiah. Peter becomes an Ezekiel because he's speaking to us just as those Old Testament prophets spoke to them when they were in the midst of the diaspora. That all makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Any questions on that? No, that's really great. That's good I just start throwing information out. And if you're like, wait, wait, back up. Where did you get that? Always feel like you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to see if I can get through a little bit more of this. Um, okay, I already covered that, covered that. Yeah, okay, so a huge theme here. Let's just, can, I don't know if y'all can see this. Let me see if I can turn it. Can y'all read that? If not, I'll read it to you. Um, major mm -hmm. themes of the book, because this is just intro. I'm not going to be breaking down scripture yet. Major themes of the book. Um, family is huge in this book. And that's why I took time to explain that concept, the diaspora, because he's telling you, you're now the family of um, Israel and um, you're grafted into Israel. You do not replace it. It's a huge difference. Um, a lot of churches take on what we call replacement theology. And it says Israel doesn't matter. The Jews don't matter anymore. It's us. I can't find that anywhere in scripture. And if, if that's the case, then we've got a big problem um, because we've got some major things we've got to fulfill. But so grafted in matters, family history matters. This is the theme. Your identity is found in the family. And so this is going to be huge for Peter as when you are scattered, when you are wandering, the strength of the individual is found in the family. It's an Old Testament concept. Joseph was only as strong as his father and his brothers were. And so you see these concepts over and over. Um, the second one that you're going to see in here is suffering and endurance. Huge theme in this book. And he's talking to the believers that were going to massive persecution. During this time, we believe Nero is in power. Um, Peter is seeing what's going on there. I mean, they're burning people um, to be light in the streets. Um, he's seeing it's one of the most bloody time of Christian um, Christianity's history. And he's writing to them saying, endure, endure, endure. Do not give up hope. So that's a huge theme. Um, inheritance is huge. He's going to see inheritance in a Trinitarian concept because he's gonna talk about the past inheritance of the prophets before us. He's gonna talk about your inheritance right now, that you can walk in now as being a person alive in Jesus Christ. And then he's gonna talk about the inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. So there's three phases of inheritance, and that's connected back to the family. Um, and then he's gonna talk about what I would call tripartite issues. He's going to start laying out how many issues that we have, uh, I put it over here, are Trinitarian. The nation, prophets, church, and the future. Family is Trinitarian. It was, it's now, it's coming. The individual is Trinitarian because you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a mind, or you have body, spirit, mind is a better way to put that. And he's going to talk about time. We are going to get time a lot. This is Peter and Paul are the only ones that use the term, I'm sorry, Peter and John, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a time period, right? And he's going to really refer to this concept of the revel, what's going to happen at the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is a time period. So you'll see um, that, that tripartite. Another theme they're going to get in here, which is huge, is government, okay? So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they each are called the synoptic gospels. Matthew is the lion because he shows Jesus as the king, right? Judah. That's his whole point. When you, when you read it from that perspective, you're seeing, oh, Matthew is a Jew of, a, you know, he's a Jew among Jews, right? He's showing, he's the king. Then you have Mark. Mark is going to be showing, um, who is Peter, remember? They're going to be showing through their writing um, Jesus as the servant. It's the ox, okay? 
Then you're going to have Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke is showing Jesus as the man, the face of man, as the salvation to man. Remember, Luke will show more stories about women and children than any other writer because he's showing the, the man coming in and saving and rescuing and redeeming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you have John, and John will show the eagle. John is going to show he is the prophet of prophets, and John has more mysteries in his writing than um, anyone else. You can use the word if you're using it correctly. Okay, correctly. John is a mystic, not the incorrect form of mystic, which is like new agey, but the original one is a writer of mysteries, right? John is like writing these deep revelations. And so he's much more, John's my favorite because he's like very philosophical and thinking about these things, whereas Paul's like, right? So that's kind of um, the layout. But then it's like, okay, where does first Peter and second Peter fit? In that, Peter is gonna show you the government of the kingdom of God because he's huge on, he's telling you the why we do what we do, the how we do what we do, and then the authority to do what we do. Remember the keys to the kingdom guy? Remember upon this rock? He's breaking down what the government of the church in the spiritual and physical is going to look like. So he's going to do alignment, authority, all of these things in these books. Um, and then Second Peter is going to be very um, what we would call apop apocalyptic. So it's going to be a revealing of the prophecy of what is to come. Jude and Second Peter are buddies. They go together. And um, you'll see that you have to literally flip back and forth between the books to get a full picture. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing. Um, and that I just wanted to give you an overview this first week before we just start breaking it all down. Um, and I'm going to give y'all a little second if you want to ask any questions, but I do want y'all this week to read through the whole book. Okay. Just take time. You don't have to do it in one sitting if you don't, but start looking for patterns, repetition, anything that you catch that he says in here that you're like, I think that's old Testament. Go try to find what story it would match because we want to be people. A great resource, if you don't use it, is blueletterbible.org. And I highly recommend it. You can have zero Greek and zero Hebrew, and that thing can help you so much because you can type in it, click on the Hebrew, click on the word, and you'll learn a lot and those connections. Um, yeah, and then, um, oh, and then for next week, so if you'll read First Peter through, and then I was going to have you read Exodus 12, 13, and 15. Just read them. Just sit as you're reading time. Um, add that in because it'll be really important to understanding next week because um, everything Peter writes, as you'll get into this, is, oh, you have to have a full, full grasp of Old Testament, which Jews would have had, right? They would have been like, yeah, of course, of course. And we don't have that sometimes, so we miss these deeper levels. Mm -hmm. So, y'all have any questions? <laughs> um, this was all wonderful. I, um, but I did, where, where was that verse that you said, um, gifts and callings of God are irrevocable? Where is that? That's going to be back in Romans 11. Okay. And it's going to be Romans 11, 29. Okay. And, and the verse before it is, as regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. It's almost like that old concept that someone said, when you see a Jewish person, you should kiss him on the face. Like you should be like, thank you, because it's for your sake. But as regards to election, remember Peter will call them the elect of the diaspora. They are beloved because of their forefathers for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Yeah. So we quote that a lot. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that we always quote it. I know I've misquoted it. But mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. I believe it applies to us. But I, when you really put it in what Paul's explaining, he's saying that it was coming back round for them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll tell you, I didn't point this out to you, but do you see on verse 25, circle the part that says until, I don't know if I had y'all do that, Romans 11, 25, until the fullness of the Gentiles. Because the time of the Gentiles is Nebuchadnezzar through Antichrist, 
okay, when the Gentiles rule. But the fullness of the Gentiles is the age of the church. And what we can see is it will end. I know it's a weird concept, but he's saying until this is done, which we believe is 2,000 years, then it will end. Um, I don't know if y'all like Thomas Larkin. I love him. This book um, he did in the 1800s. If you've never looked through, and you can just Google his pictures, but he does stuff like this. And what he's showing you is this is the revelation of Jew, Gentile, and church. And through drawings, he shows you the Semitic age. And then the age of the church comes in right here, right? And then he's like, but then the church is going to rapture and the Jews are flowing back in again. Remember, this is all the prophecies that we see in scripture and um, of like in the book of Revelation, for instance, the 144,000 people have always really struggled to understand that. But what if we read it for exactly what it is? They're listed in tribes. You and I are not listed in tribes. We are individuals brought into the church. They are a nation always a nation. And so that 144,000, I believe without, I mean, just flat out that that is a prophetic picture of when the Jews come to realize, because Jesus said, you are rejected until you call out on my name. So they are going to come back. It's just the timing. And the timing was so important so that you and I could come in. It's a gift so that you and I could come to salvation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So can I, I don't want to take up too much time if everybody has to go. I, I just have a question. So I, my knowledge on Jews and their understanding of scripture is, is very lacking. I mean, um, but I did, I did learn, you know, that a lot of the Jews, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Is that correct? I mean, there's different kinds of Jews. There's ones that it's um, the messianic. messianic Jews, and they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but then there's another Jew that believe that the Messiah has not come yet. That's right. So what you're saying is that that's, that's intentional, that at some point the Jews will come to accept and call on Jesus as their Messiah, but it's that gap that God is giving us as a gift to bring in more of us Gentiles. Is, that, is that what you mean? And, and during the age of the church, remember, there is no Jew. There is no Gentile. There is no male. There is no female. The age of the church is once you come in, those names fall away, right? But after Revelation 4.1, the book goes back to a very Jewish Bible. And, and we also should remember that four-fifths, if you want, like um, four out of five of the Bible, it's written to Israel. And, and, and please don't misunderstand me. All of it's written to you as well. But so often we divorce ourselves from this concept and then we struggle to understand scripture. And it's like this concept was God's concept that he laid out. I didn't write it, you didn't write it. And so yes, there is a season, two days specifically, Micah 6 prophesies this. Um, if you just wanted to have some markers for it. I have a couple videos on this too. Um, but remember Jesus even alluded to this when he said, um, I will tear down, uh, I'm like going blank on that, where, where they're talking about um, tearing down the temple and on the third day I will raise it up again. It says that he was talking about his body. But it was a play on words also because Israel would be rejected for two days and on the third day they will come back in. And so, and you see that in Micah, there's so many prophecies about this, um, where you're going to start seeing this concept of there is a two day period, a 2000 year period of the church. We will be removed. And then he's going to deal with Israel again. 1948 was pivotal for us because no one ever believed they'd get that land back. And they did. And to this day, you have three sets. You have Messianic Jews, which believe in Christ. You have Reformed Jews. They're no longer even looking for a Messiah because they don't believe Messiah is a real person. They believe it's a conceptual idea. And then you have Orthodox Jews. They're looking for a Messiah. And so um, somehow the Lord is saying he will redeem all of that. But how? 
you know, some of that's the mystery that Paul is talking about until the fullness of the Gentiles is complete. And this is really what Paul struggled with, um, but accepted, but Peter seemed to struggle with um, a lot. Yeah. So, but it is like, if you've never heard the concept, you're like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> but um, I'm trying to think, there is some great videos out there that I could put links to that kind of start breaking down this concept more and showing you where the prophecies were, um, how to view it, there, there's some really great work on this done. Yeah. Well, if you have something, I'd love to, to research some more on that. That's yeah. really interesting to me. Yeah, it is. And it starts making things make sense that we kind of skip over because we're like, oh, I don't understand that part. And, um, um, and Larkin's books are good too, because like this is showing the prophet and how he viewed all the way out here to the new earth and everything. And they're prophesying that, but down in the valley is the age of the church. Like they missed it too. They did not see Jew Gentiles coming in. And so you'll see old Testament prophecies that are saying things like um, a nation that is not a nation will become, will call out and become my people. Well, who is that? That's the Gentiles, right? There's so many prophecies, but they could not see it. Just like, honestly, the church has struggled to see that they are also still a part of this um, equation. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Those are good questions. <laughs> Do you have any more questions about that? No, I think, I think this will give me some good things to, to study. Yeah. And I'm excited to, to dig in because this is a book that I haven't. I haven't really studied through first or second Peter. So this is exciting for me to dig in. And I've been kind of looking for that to grow in those areas. Yes. And Peter, almost every single foundational doctrine that we believe in Christianity, Peter hits on, which is really mm -hmm. cool for a fisherman yeah. to have so much insight. Um, you can tell it's the Holy Spirit working. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, great. Well, I'll, um, and then I'll post these too, if y'all want to go back and look at them or anything. And then next week we'll like start breaking down scripture and getting into it. But I felt like we needed a kind of an overall picture to go in a little deeper. Yeah. So this will be every Thursday, like same time yeah. for a while. Okay. And there, make it if you can, if you can't, I'll post the videos and you can catch up later, but that's kind of the concept. And, um, yeah, anyone who wants to come can come and we'll be on here at 10 30. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. Bye, ladies. Bye, Carrie. Bye. Bye. Bye.